Okay, can you remote folks hear me? Um, okay, so today we're going to be talking about a different topic. We talked about a topic today that's going to bring different understanding probably to each person in the class. This is an entirely new topic that you won't find elsewhere, and I'm very keenly aware of our limited time in the, in the sessions that remain today and Tuesday. Um, and I'm having the triage. There's a lot of material you'll find online on my uh, course sites that you'll find useful, I think. There's uh, material on debugging, for example, debugging in any logic that I'd refer you uh, to. There's some material on best practices um, on the process side, best practices on the technical side. There's issues of performance and how to enhance performance of models. But I decided to do something different today. I decided to talk about something that I do believe will confer value to everyone in this class, but it will confer different value to the different people here uh, based on your backgrounds. You're going to each come away with something different, but I can almost guarantee each of you will come away with something, something that you, you could find practical if you choose to put it into practice. And the topic is is one I haven't covered in online videos, at least not, not in this uh, depth. And I'm looking forward to adding it to the collection. You may, if you want to take advantage of these things, you'll probably have to go back to this because, because there's a depth of material today that, although I've covered some fairly sophisticated ideas, um, some of the ideas behind calibration and so on, um, some of the ideas in scoping the model, et cetera, this, this really takes the cake. And it, and it has to do with dimensional analysis, dimensional reason, and how we can use it to build better models. Um, so dimensional analysis is a technique that's historically been very, very important for scoping models. By models here, I don't necessarily mean simulation models. In fact, it's underused for them. It should be used a lot more, but I mean more analytic models formulating them, validating them, and calibrating them. Um, in the systems modeling community, most notably the system dynamics community using Benson has, and, and other related tools like PowerSim, I think, et cetera, it's made important limited use of, of uh, dimensional analysis. Um, any logic is broadening its support um, for dimensional analysis. And there's really strong advantage for, uh, advantages that can, are conferred by further dimensional analysis use and improving that use. And I have a particular concern in the context of this course in performance issues. The fact is, as many of you have noted, if you've gotten to this point in your modeling, if you start to try to scale your model to larger and larger populations, maybe it's larger populations of people, maybe it's larger populations of animals, maybe it's larger populations of agents in the form of road segments, any logic starts to get really slow. And if we seek to understand the behavior of a model with a very large population, the naive way to go, to go about that is to build a model that's of the full population. Straight, straightforward conceptually, it can impose a huge computational challenge to churn through that model. Now, for years, engineers have recognized the advantage of building what are called scale models. So, so if an engineer traditionally is going to design a plane, or they're going to design a bridge, they're going to design a building that's a, quite some sophistication, they might build a small scale model of it. And it's not just for showing to clients what it will look like. You can actually do testing, for example, in a reduced scale model of, a, of an airplane. You can do it in a wind tunnel in a way that a full scale model, you, you wouldn't be able to do it. It wouldn't be feasible. Um, and when it comes to computational models, we can build reduced scale models whose behavior will be representative of the behavior of a full scale model in some principled way. 
but will require a lot less computational time. So we can build a reduced scale model, say, of a population that involves not a billion agents, but 10,000 or 100,000, and scale it in some principled way, the results, to figure out what the results would be for a full-scale population. But not everyone who's sitting here is probably going to find find that they're they're able to absorb all of that. And I'm going to walk through a bunch of different ways in today's lecture that dimensional analysis can help you model. Okay. For some people, this will all be basically new, and you may only understand the first of them. Some people who have encountered this before may find yourself appreciating all of these different, um, different features. But what I'm talking about here is really deep, and every time I come to it, I find myself sort of appreciating with new, with new depth sort of um, some of the points to learn from here. It's, it's, it's one of these subjects that just keeps on giving, uh, no matter how much you seem to fully understand it, there's new twist to it and, and remarkable things you can accomplish with. And unfortunately, it's one of those arts which is not widely talked about these days, uh, at least in, in a, lot of, um, a lot of academia, a lot of uh, uh, computational and um, quantitative sciences. So the first, the first benefit is preventing mistakes. And we're going to see that dimensional analysis used by anyone in this room can be one of the most valuable tools for keeping, for, for avoiding silly mistakes. Preventing yourself from making a silly error when putting together a model. Putting in the times instead of the division. Adding a stock to a flow. using the wrong term, the wrong variable in a model. And it turns out that there's a technique, um, dimensional hom homogeneity testing, that can be automated. And in fact, in Vensum, it is automated. And I'll show you how to use that. Okay. It can be also done manually. And for an any logic model, you could run through and just make sure that your equations make sense. This is really powerful because at first glance, the equation may look decent, but when you really think it through, it may be nonsensical. And you can spot that and eliminate it from your model. So that's really important. It's used by me on a regular basis. It's used by uh, uh, people worldwide. But it's sort of the most simple application of what we'll be talking about today. We might talk about some of it on Tuesday, too, the extension of this lecture. A second thing that's, that's deeper yet is thinking through what, what parameters need to be used in a formula and how they should be used in a formula. Thinking through that ahead of time. And you can often derive things without doing any experiments or anything. What, what must be the characteristic behavior of this model? That's really deep. And um, it's been used historically for real breakthroughs in understanding. So just from base principles, from calculations based on the nature of the dimensions involved, for example, it was figured out what the, what the, what the speed of, of uh, spread from an atomic bomb explosion must be without needing to do an actual experiment. And that's important. You can figure these things out. Turns out there's some things with the sort of models we build that can be figured out in this way. And that's useful. That can make you a virtuoso in terms of modeling. Another thing that's, that's, I think, would speak to the needs of many people in this room and could be applied, although it's, it requires more sophistication than the first in this list, is reducing the number of parameters that are required for calibration and parameterization. One of the problems we saw with, with um, parameterization, uh, excuse me, this, uh, I, I, this, this is a mistake. This should say, it should not say parameterization. It should say calibration. Okay, sorry about that. Um, oh, sorry, calibration and sensitivity analysis. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, 
There we go. Um, okay. Uh, can you folks still see my slides there remotely? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, so one of the problems that we have with calibration that we talked about last time is that as the number of parameters that you're calibrating goes up, it takes a longer time to calibrate because you have to explore a larger dimensional space. And it can require, you can end up with more situations of kind of mis un where you're unclear how to interpret it. Maybe that multiple parameter values give you equally good results. It takes a lot longer to explore a three-dimensional space than a two-dimensional, or five than a four. Often. So keeping down the number of parameters you have to calibrate can be pretty important. And similarly for sensitivity analysis, you can examine the sensitivity of your model with respect to 100 different parameters in turn. But if you start to think about examining with respect to combinations of them, and it becomes extremely burdensome. And even just doing those first hundred or whatever can be really burdensome. We can cut down the number of parameters we need to do sensitivity with respect to. Go from six to four, for example, using dimensional analysis. That's useful. The fourth thing is what I mentioned earlier, creating models with smaller populations that can be used to understand the behavior of models with larger populations. Models with small populations, reduced scale models are in some sense representative of larger models. Okay. And then finally, there's this phenomenon called power law scaling, where we note the scaling of, when we collect data, we may note that one parameter's value tends to be described very closely by the power law of another. So we may have some variable y that's a function of another variable x by doing x to the a. And these things are very common. Does anyone remember where we saw that earlier in class? A power law relationship? I'll give you a hint. What does that look like on a log log graph? We take the log of y. What is the log of y? Speak use. If I take the log of the left side, what's the log of the right side? Log of y equals, if we have y equals x to the a power, we take log of y, what's on the right side? a log x. A log x. So if we plot this out on a graph where we have log x on the x-axis, a log log graph, and log y on the y-axis, what do we get? Let's suppose that a is negative, as it, as it often is. Well, what do we get? We get a... Linear? Yeah, it's linear. So we get a line in log log space. We actually saw that one place. This X was the number of sexual partners over a year. And Y was the probability of having at least that number of sexual partners. The log log graph. Power law behavior. Now this sort of power law behavior is, is quite common in complex systems. But it, almost, it often, it very often results from dimensional considerations. And we can explain it often by recourse to dimensional analysis, the nature of the dimensions involved. Okay, so I'd like to talk about dimensions. And this, to certain people here, will probably be new material. And this is probably the most important thing, that you at least understand this. For some of you, probably old hat. But even where you've seen this informally, it's worth paying attention. Because often you're not taught this explicitly. It's just kind of thrown in as a side uh, in, in a early course in math or what have you. OK, the deal is here is this. When we describe things in the world, we describe things out there, we often 
characterize the semantic category of the thing that we're describing. So we're measuring a length. We're measuring an area, right? We're measuring a weight of something, a pressure, a level of acceleration, or what have you. These things kind of describe the character of the thing we're, we're recognizing. And when we say we're measuring a length or an area, we're abstracting over. We're not, we're not talking about the specific yardstick we're using, so to speak. We're not saying yet whether we're measuring the length in meters or, or in yards or fathoms or, or you know, uh, parsecs. We're just, we're just describing the type of thing we're measuring. It's a, it's a length. It's an area. Square meters, square feet, we're, we're not specific. Okay? Um, the key thing here is that those quantities which are in your model, folks, A's and B's and thetas or whatever the, they are, they typically have unique dimensions associated with them. They refer to something that has a dimension. And those models you build in Benson, those different variables in it, the stocks, the flows, et cetera, they have dimensions. Maybe some are cost. Maybe some are cost per unit time. Abstracting over what's in Canadian dollars per week or Canadian dollars per year, what have you, it's cost per unit time. Or maybe it's people per year. Or maybe it's dollars per person. Or, you know, mud cost per person. There are dimensions of these things. And when we're describing the world, when our models are not simply sort of arbitrary programs that, that, that manipulate numbers like a benchmark might, but they're instead describing something about the world, the, the quantities in it, they have a semantic meaning to them, and they describe these sort of things. Now, within a dimension, we can describe the units, too. So if we're dealing with length, we might have units like foot, meters, fathoms, parsecs, etc. Furlongs. If we're dealing with seconds, we might have microseconds, weeks, centuries. These are, as it were, describe different measurement references for those things. They're yardsticks, as it were, speaking metaphorically. And these things, like the dimensions and the units, they're metadata about the numbers. Okay, our program has numbers in it, but the numbers mean something. And these things describe the meaning of those numbers. Okay, this is 4.5 what? Is it days, or is it weeks, or is it years? It matters often. It matters because so whether the program is consistent, whether it's meaningful, in fact. So units describe our sort of yardsticks, as they were, and they relate to a particular dimension. So a given unit will be specific to a dimension. So it's units of length or units of area, or units of time, or units of volume, or units of, of, um, of angle, or what have you. Now, we can convert between units. We can convert a meter to feet, you know, something measured in meters to something in feet, and we do that routinely. We can convert something measured in microseconds to something in years. Mm -hmm. Dimensions, we typically, we don't have a, so we do this conversion for units with, by multiplying by some value. We convert inches to centimeters by multiplying by 2.54, right? Um, we don't have a similar conversion factor between units. We don't convert a length into an area by multiplying by some unit. It's meaningless. We can't. You can't add a, in any way a length to an area. You can't say, well, it's one square foot plus one lineal foot, and the result is three. It doesn't make sense. Okay. Um, and a given quantity in our model has one dimension, folks. It could be expressed in many units. We could describe the length of this road segment in many units, for example. And we're going to come to these special sort of quantities that are, that are really important because they're the, the natural quantities of how the world works, called dimensionless quantities. And these have units. 
associated with them as well. Different units of, of, of angle, for example. Okay, so here's some you know, so we, we, we have a, we could have a frequency as a dimension. And dimension is one over time, but we could have one per year, one per second, one per week, one per day. Those are all frequencies, the different units of frequency. And each of the quantities in your model if it's a number, it should have a unit and it should have a, a dimension associated with it. So you should be able to think for everything in your model, every number that's there, you should be able to say, oh, this is a this unit. And if you can't, that's a sign that there may be a serious problem. For angle, we may have radians or we measure, may measure in degrees. This is this special quantity called dimensionless we'll come to. It has a very particular meaning, a very important meaning, a very important role. And then there's distance, where we might have dimensions of length, and we can measure it in different ways. Okay. Um, so it turns out that there's, there's no unique dimensional system. Uh, dimensional systems are, are products of, of our choices. And we may impose, you know, system international as our dimensional system for for weights and measures. Uh, that's fine. We can actually choose how many dimensions we have and so on. Um, but I'm not going to get into that because that's there's there's some deep stuff I don't have time to explain there. But fundamentally, if we have a set of dimensions, we can think of a given quantity. Okay. Now this is going to push some of you. We could think of a given quantity as a pair of a value and some dimension. So it has some number, three. And, and then it has, a, a, say, units in this case, units associated with it. So it's meters per second, or people per year. And if quantities, dimensions, or units, either one of them could be represented as products of power. Okay? So you might have rate of water flow as liters cubed per unit time. So it might be liters cubed per second, the rate of the Saskatchewan River flow. Or we could measure it in gallons per year. We could do that too. Those are just different units for measuring something of length to the cube per unit time. This is the dimension. We have different ways of measuring it. Liters per second, you, uh, gallons per year. Right? And so, so we have a number. We have a number, three. And maybe it means three animals, or maybe it means three thousands of animals in our model. And we, that's kind of metadata about that number, OK? We could also think of it as kind of a vector in a d-dimensional space where each dimension represents an exponent for a particular dimension. You notice here, this is, this is like liters per unit time. That's the, oh, sorry, this is, excuse me, this says liters cubed per, per unit time, um, or sorry, length cubed per unit, not liters cubed, what am I saying? Length cubed per unit time. And, and, it might be cubic meters per, per unit time. Sorry, I didn't, I shouldn't have said liters. It's cubic meters per unit time. So whatever our measure of length is, maybe it's cubic meters, maybe it's cubic feet. We can have different units of measuring the same dimensional quantity, okay? Different units of measuring rates of water flow. Um, and it turns out that the fact that we have these pairings of a value and a dimension constrains what we can do meaningfully with them. So, for example, we might express, this is this, is this notion of this being a vector, that the units or, or dimensions can be represented as a vector. Here we might have length squared per time squared, okay? So if we square a velocity, velocity is length per unit time. If we square that, we get length squared per time squared, okay? And that would be represented as L squared times T to the minus 2. Okay. Um, why if I put it out here? Well, the dimension of time is minus 2. That's that exponent there. 
and the dimension of length is two. Okay, um, a velocity would be here, right? Be a, a length per unit time. But right now this is length and time, but this could be persons and time, in which case this would be, you know, persons per unit time might be the measure of the incident case rate. How many people are getting infection per day, what have you? A stock of persons, the count of infectious people, might be measured in persons. Okay? Another way we could think of this is having this dimensional space, where again we have sort of length and time, say, along these respective axes. And each number would be sort of associated with the length along here that represents its value. So we have, for example, maybe um, two meters per second. Here we have time minus one and one, and, and it would be a meter to the one power would be out, out here. Okay. Um, okay, so the deal here is when we have these quantities, we can associate them with a number, but it's not just a number. It's a number with a dimension or a unit that indicates what sort of, what's the yardstick used to measure that, and what sort of thing is it. Okay, so X, we might have a variable X in our model, or in our program, in our agent-based model, or in our Vensa model. And this might have a quantity of one, but it's further labeled as being dollars per foot, or dollar per person. Maybe this is, Maybe this is the number of dollars required for a test for chlamydia for this person. One dollar per person is the cost of the test. Mm -hmm. We could have that, right? Here, suppose it's dollars per foot. We could, we could convert this to meters, right? So if we wanted to convert a dollars per foot to a, to a dollars per meter, we could multiply by the number of feet per meter, right? Mm -hmm. So if we had some something we know it costs dollars per foot, we want to ask, okay, how many dollars does it take to, you know, per per meter now? We could we just multiply it by how many feet there are in a meter, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Now, if we had some other measurements, like dollars per foot squared, suppose we had a model of apartment pricing, real estate pricing, right? House pricing or what have you, for commercial real estate, maybe it's, it's office space. We have dollars per, and we want to convert squared, excuse me, um, per square foot. And we want to convert that into dollars per square meter. We could, we would multiply it, but we wouldn't multiply it by feet per meter. We'd multiply it by feet per meter squared. Right? So if this costs one dollar per square foot, and we want to ask, well, okay, I'm used to thinking in square meters. How much is that per square meter? I wouldn't just multiply by 3.208, which is the number of feet per meter. Instead, I have to multiply times that square because of this square here, of the fact that this is length, uh, dollars per length squared. So what I'm saying here is that the exponent for this dimension, the fact that there's a square here means when we convert from one dimension to another, we want it to convert to meter square because this is the dimension of this is cost per length squared. When we convert it to a different unit of length here, meters, we have to multiply times that coefficient to the squared power. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, this is the thing which gets pretty deep. I mean, I think, I think we're all comfortable with this. We've all hopefully done these conversions before in our lives at one point or another. We're reasoning about square footage. And we want to rent something for a small company. And we ask, okay, well, what is it per square meter? Because we have our needs in square meters. And so we could convert it in the appropriate way. 
right? Um, or if you're calculating the area of a pizza, and you know how much, you know, the, the, how much you can eat in square meters of pizza, um, you might convert it, and you know, accordingly. I mean, it's this nine-inch pizza, and so you might figure out, okay, is that enough for two people or one person? Um, okay, but this is this is getting closer to the heart of the matter for some of our work, okay? The dimensions of a quantity do not depend on a given dimension. In other words, we may have in our model dimensions of length, of time, of person, and of dollar. And if a given quantity only depends on, say, dollars in feet, if I were to write this out, if this is dollars per foot, I could write out its dimension as cost to the one power, length to the minus one power, minus one because it's dollars per foot, the foot is not the denominator, and I could, what would its, what would its exponent be for time? What's the exponent of that for time? If this were dollar per square foot per year or per month, let's say, for real estate, what would be the dimension for time? The dimension. It would be Help me think these things through. Dollar per square foot per month. That's what you might pay to rent an office space, an innovation place, right? Dollar per square foot per month. Hmm? What's the dimension, what's the exponent associated with the time dimension? We could re represent this, we could write this as dollar over foot times month, right? Dollar, dollar per square foot per all per month, and so we could rewrite as dollar per foot times month. What's the exponent associated with time? What would be the exponent associated with time for that? No, minus one. It'd be minus one. Because time is in the denominator here to the one power. We don't write it as to the month one, but it would be minus one. Okay, so so if we had dollar per foot per month, it would be that. So how if I just have dollar per foot? What's the what's the um, dimension associated with that? We again have cost to the one length to the minus one, because foot is a, is a unit of length. And what do we have for time? Is it time to the one? Is it time to the minus one? Well, folks, we write it as time to the zero. What's the value of, of a given quantity x, a non-zero quantity x to the zeroth power? It's what? One. one. So in short, it's saying it doesn't depend on time. There's no dependence on time. Does that make sense? No dependence on time at all why, for this? Why would you bother writing in time at all then? I can think of three million different variables and units you can add in there, but there's no sense in time. There is a sense. There's a big sense. So for a given problem, we decide on the units that are relevant, or the dimensions that are relevant. And we're going to have to use that in a big way in coming slides. So we're going to have to delineate, for our model, what are the relevant dimensions? And that's why I was saying earlier, suppose our model had person, time, dollars, and cost, and say length. Right? Um, now we have four dimensions. And this is what I was saying earlier that I, I glossed over. We can choose our dimensional system. And for this model, those are the four that matter. Now we could write out all the others, but it turns out that's not going to be useful. Okay? 
if if our quantities don't refer to them, if they don't if they don't depend on them in any way, it's not going to be useful exercise. We could do it. It's not going to hurt, except it's going to waste our time. But if our quantities are actually with respect to these dimensions, if some quantities are, you know, dollars per person, and others are dollars per meter, you know, time, others are person per meter squared, or something like that, for density of people in an area, we will want to use those dimensions in writing this up. Okay, those dimensions which are relevant to our model. So what I'm saying here is that dollars per foot because it doesn't mention time, it doesn't depend on our unit of time. It's invariant to what our choice of time is. We can write it out in this form. Cost to the one power, length to the minus one power, time to the zeroth power. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's complete the circle here, folks. So up here I said, if you are converting between units, if you're converting between units, that the conversion constant you use depends on the units you're con the power associated with the unit conversion. So if I am if I have something like this dollars per foot, and I want to convert it to dollars per meter, because I'm shopping for lumber or something, or maybe I'm talking about the dollars to build a subway then I have to multiply it times number of feet per meter. But if I'm dealing with dollars per foot squared, I have to multiply it times feet per meters quantity squared, which is 10.7864. Um, so suppose we have something that has its power. Suppose we have dollars per foot, and I decide to convert time. I want to I measure time in years rather than in days. And I have a dollars per foot quantity in my model. What do I have to multiply that by to convert time in that way? Well, I'm saying what you have to multiply by depends on the power associated with the thing. So for this calculation, what I had to multiply by was one per foot per meter, be precisely because this is one foot to the one power. So I'll, I'll just make this very explicit, like that. This is per foot square power, so I'm, I'm multiplying um, times, times that there. So folks, what do I need to multiply by if I have this to the power of zero? One. In other words, it doesn't depend on it, so I'm, it's multiplied by one. Five dollars per foot, and I decide if I have something a dollars per foot, and I decide I want to measure time instead of in seconds. I want to measure it in years. Multiply it times times that conversion constant second per year to zeroth power, which is one. So it doesn't change, in other words, right? When I convert in this way units, it doesn't change because it's the zeroth power. So it doesn't change. Okay, so so look, we can express a board's length in our model if we wanted to as length times time to the zeroth power. And that's basically saying it doesn't depend on time. So if we want to convert time from milliseconds to microseconds or milliseconds to centuries. It, it, it's not going to change the board's length. It's not going to change at all. But if we want to convert meters to feet, then that will change length in a linear sort of way. Okay. So in short, the conversion that's required when we adjust our units depends on the, the, the that exponent in the appropriate dimension. So if this is something feet per meter squared, then we're going to have the square of the conversion constant. If it's feet per meter, we want to convert from meters to feet. It's going to depend on first power. If it's feet per meter and we, uh, we're going to convert time, it doesn't depend at all because it's time to the zeroth power. Okay. What's particularly interesting, folks, 
is that because we can describe the dimensions associated with quantities as products of powers, there are some quantities that have all powers, all exponents of zero associated with them. So we saw here length per foot. That's cost to the one power, length to the minus one, and we wrote it as t to zero. If we're, and maybe if we have persons in our model, we would have written p to the zero for person to zero. Okay. Um, but there are some quantities that are going to be have consistently zero for these cost to the zero, length to the zero, time to the zero, person to the zero. We call these as being of unit dimension. Or we call these dimensionless quantities. Now, this is somewhat of a misnomer. They do have a dimension, it's just a very special dimension. It's a dimension where they depend, uh, they just have uh, have the exponent zero for each of each of the dimensions. But these quantities are very deep because if we change units, they don't change. If we change any of the units in the model, we don't change. So let's talk about some dimensionless quantities. Well, let me ask this: Can anyone here come up with a dimensionless quantity? You use them all the time. You use dimensionless quantities all the time. They're not going to depend on any units. They're independent of the units. Can anyone give me an example of a dimensionless quantity? It doesn't depend on the units you use. It doesn't depend on the yardstick. You could talk to someone from another planet. You could talk with someone in the U.S. who's using imperial units and you'll be speaking metric units. And you could talk with them, and still the value would be the same that you're talking about. Give me an example of a quantity like that. So pi or e or something. OK. So that's an interesting question, um, whether pi is dimensionless. I, I believe it, yes, it would be dimensionless, actually. And that's a dimensionless value. And what you're getting to is the reason you pick, I mean, the reason pi is so significant is because it's a ratio. It's a ratio of a circumference, right, to a diameter. Excuse me, radius. So here we have a, a quantity. It's a, it's a ratio. It's a ratio of two lengths. And it doesn't depend if you measure the radius, as long as you measure both in the same unit. You measure the radius in feet and the circumference in feet, that's fine. If you measure it in meters and the other meters, and you compute it, no matter how you measure it, the, the, the quantity dividing the two will be the same, right? So, and in general, there, there's others too that are going to be familiar. Fractions. If I asked what fraction of this room is covered by this table, right? This, this table covers a fraction of this room. And if I ask our US uh, participants what fraction, they would give a fraction. Maybe they're measuring it. Maybe they actually do the measurements to figure out, you know, in, in, using a, a, a yardstick and in, in, in feet. And they'll come up with an estimate. Maybe, maybe they'll say it covers 5% of the room. And you folks could do your measurements with meters in centimeters, would you come up with the same number? What fraction of the room is covered by this? What fraction of the surface area of the room is covered by this? Yeah, it would be the same number. It doesn't matter if you're using metric or English units. It's irrelevant. The fraction of the room that's covered by this table is dimensionless. It's a dimensionless quantity. It doesn't depend on dimension. You could, a Martian who uses some weird dimension like the length of their octopus forearm or something like that. Um, you know, they could measure it and they come up with a number. It would be the same same number, it would be regardless of, of the choice of length. Another one is the likelihood. 
probability, a fraction of times the coin flips heads. These quantities, like likelihoods, fractions, these are independent of unit choice. We can pick whatever time unit we want. We can pick whatever unit for measuring number of people, whether it's in thousands or individuals. We could measure time in a different number of ways, or length, or, or, or cost. These things won't change. They're independent of that. So these dimensionless quantities would be coming right out from there in this kind of dimensional space. They have zero dimension for time, zero dimension for length, for example. It's a dimensionless quantity. Now, the interesting thing is dimensionless quantities are the important quantities in terms of how the world works. That's a bold statement. I'm going to say it again. The world works in terms of dimensionless quantities. It doesn't care about our dimensions. We could choose whatever dimensions we want as people. We could go back to the imperial unit system, whatever. The world's, the world's not going to change any differently. The world functions in terms of dimensionless quantities. And when we describe the world in our models, our models need to be able to be described in terms of dimensionless quantities. They shouldn't depend on, their validity shouldn't depend on our choice of dimensions. As long as we do the requisite unit calculations, it should be fine. So I'd like to talk about how we could use this basic background that we've talked about for, for your purposes. Okay. And the first of these things is to be able to spot nonsense calculations within your model, spot errors in your models. And ladies and gentlemen, well, this stuff is super deep. And this stuff can make you a virtuoso if you really understand it, the, the contents of this lecture. It can make you a virtuoso uh, in modeling. Um, this is one of the most important things you can do, even as a beginning modeler. Maybe especially as a beginning model, but, but even if you're highly advanced. It is so easy in your models to do something that is meaningless. It is so easy to assign the value of a flow to be something like 1 over the value of the stock, or, or to be the value of the stock plus some other quantity. And it's meaningless. It's meaningless. You could set the value of a flow to be the value of the stock times the mean time you spend in that stock. That is a meaningless quantity. It doesn't make sense dimensionally. It's as meaningless as adding a person to a dollar saying one person plus two dollars is equal to three whatever. It, it's semantically nonsensical. And yet we do this all the time. We do it because of typos. We do it because of we, we go in to change something. We didn't read, read it properly. We go in because we changed the definition of a variable. We forgot to change all its uses and so on. And the best thing is the, this can be checked automatically at least in some of the software packages, including Pencil. It can be at least recorded in any logic. I'd have to see if any logic uh, checks it consistently. I don't think it does in, in the level of detail that Benson does. OK, so let's talk about this um, in terms of, let's say, stocks and flows, as we've learned in the class. Consider a stock. This is a stock X. And now we consider its flows. I would argue that the dimension, if the dimension of that stock is X, maybe it's persons. That's a dimension because we could measure a person by the thousands, could measure them by the ones. I'm just going to say by the it counts persons, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the flows are going to have what unit, what dimensions associated with it? It's going to be what? If a stock is persons, the dimensions of the flows are going to be what? 
person per time, person per time. We might write it this way. The dimension of a flow is equal to the dimension of a stock divided by time. Okay. And this follows. It has to follow because the stock is the integral of the flow. We can write value of the stock at time t is equal to the integral from the initial time to t of you know, the, inflow minus the, out, the inflow minus the outflow at time t dt times dt, right? What is the unit of dt? The unit of dt is time. There's a small interval, a delta t, a small bit of time. And we multiply it by the flows, which are of units x over here, person over time, and we get persons, and the integral sums up those persons. Okay? So we're summing up the values of some of these time steps, um, or multiply the flow by time in each of those time steps. Okay. Um, now, there's some <coughs> rules of thumb for computing, to compute the dimensions or the units associated with the quantity. What is the units associated with the quantity? Well, you should be asking, excuse me, um, what steps does one go through to calculate it? If I were to change units, would the value of this matter? Is this persons or person per time? Well, if you're changing time, would the value of this be different? If we're thinking about incidents, and we said 100 people were infected in Saskatoon. Or 100 people got diabetes in Saskatoon. Or if we're measuring sort of how quickly people are getting diabetes, you'd have to ask, well, over what period of time? Is that bad or good? Well, are you talking about per second? Or per year? Or per month? Whereas you're just counting the number of people with diabetes now. Does it depend whether we are measuring in centuries or seconds or years? So we can use, use sort of thinking about this, um, uh, reflecting on this, we can often zero in what the dimensions are associated with the quantity. Um, so I haven't really talked about this, but we need to start talking about it now. So suppose we have one quantity x. And it has dimensions associated with it. We have another quantity y that has other dimensions with it. We know how to multiply x times y. If needed, we could go to a multiplication table. But what are the units of x times y? Well, it turns out that we just carry out the parallel operations with units. So if we have dimensions, or units for that matter, associated with x, and we have dimensions or units associated with y, we just perform the comparable operations on them. So for multiplying x times y, we multiply the dimensions. So we, if we have a stock measured in cost or in persons, and we have a chance per unit time, a likelihood per unit time of developing diabetes. What is the unit of the likelihood per unit time? So suppose we have a stock that is unit person. Maybe a stock is number of normal glycemic people, people without diabetes. And suppose, so we have the stock and we're going to have an alpha times the stock. And the stock is of unit, is of, of dimension person, and suppose an alpha is a hazard, it's a chance per unit time, a likelihood per unit time, a likelihood per, maybe per month or per year. What is the unit of, what is the dimension of that? Likelihood per unit time. What's the dimension associated with likelihood, folks? I said it earlier. It's one of the special ones. Very special one. What's the unit associated with the likelihood? We can think of a unit of likelihood as a fraction of times that something happens. We roll a dice. So what's the unit of it? 
a fraction. What's the unit? Or sorry, the dimension associated with it? It's zero. Yeah, it's dimensionless. It's dimensionless. And we might write that as one, but here it's likely in per unit time, so it's one over time. Okay? One over I'll write this sure, one over time. Okay? This is a one over time. So it's dimensionless over time. And if we multiply now alpha times x, what is the unit of the multiplication of the quantity that results from that multiplication? We have alpha times x in our model. What's the dimension associated with that? If we have these two things as dimension of these, what's the dimension associated with alpha times x? Hmm? Person per time. Person times one, just gives person, the one is the units of uh, the, the sort of uh, dimensionless quantity. So it's person per time. If I had the eraser here, I, I'd make these nice capitalized in the appropriate way. It's just person per time. So if we multiply quantities, all we do is multiply the appropriate dimensions. And if we're dealing with powers, we just we have the same dimension and different powers. We just add the powers up. So if we have dollars per foot and we multiply it by people per foot, we get people times dollars. So people dollars per foot squared. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so here we just carry out this operation um, operation in parallel. Now. The key principle of dimensional homogeneity is if you add or you subtract two quantities, they have to have the same dimension. It is meaningless for them not to have the same dimension. Now, I might know I want to distinguish two things here. And I want to be very clear about this in your head. If you have two items of different units. It's meaningful, but you have to convert them to be numerically sensible, numerically correct. So if I have one second plus one minute, could you add them together? If I have a one in my model representing a second and a one representing a minute, can I just add those and get a two? No. What do I have to do? Yeah. So I, I convert. I multiply the one minute times seconds per minute, right? Times in seconds per minute. So let's be, let's be clear about what's going on there. We have we have a one second. And we'd like to add it to one minute. So to do that, we have to add one second plus one, this is one minute, times, times seconds per minute, right? Um, and, and times a, a value per second per minute, which is 60, right? And, and then these two minutes will cancel the minute one minute times second per minute, the one in the numerator and denominator will cancel. So this is going to be one second plus one second times 60, which is going to be 61 seconds, right? So essentially, we have converted the units there properly. We can't just add them. It will be meaningless to add. We get them numerically incorrect if we, if we added them. But what's worse than that? is if you had dollars plus persons. Or, or for, I mean, that sounds implausible, but believe me, all the time in student models, I see, well, or sometimes in my own model, I'll see person plus person per time. If I add a, a prevalence value, count of persons with diabetes now, plus an incidence value, people who got diabetes in the last month, 
and I just add them up, I'm getting a quantity which is which is not meaningful. What I'd have to do is, if I wanted to make that meaningful, people with diabetes plus people per month getting diabetes times how many months? One month, say. And then I can add them together, because now we've got person plus person. Okay, so adding things of different dimension is semantically incoherent. Doll plus person, meter, excuse me, uh, yeah, meter plus second. This is fatally flawed. How do you add a meter to a second? How do you add a second to a person? Just doesn't make sense. The thing that should scare you folks is, if you put this into Bensim and you don't ask it to check, or if you put it into any logic, you don't ask it to check, it will happily do that. One plus one equals two. The two is meaningless. It, it's junk. It's garbage. It means nothing full of sound and fury, signifying nothing, as Shakespeare said it, although he didn't have this in mind. Um, but you can use it to your advantage by getting it to check for you. Adding items to different units, but same dimension, is semantically sensible, but numerically incorrect. You've got to put in that conversion factor. And the key thing here is you want to add things that are comparable dimensions and comparable units within that dimension. And I could go into some stuff that's a little bit more advanced there. Turns out that there's some theory that comes from this in terms of the meaning of A to the B. It basically, if you have A to the B power, B has to be dimensionless for this to be meaningful. Um, if you think it through. Um, so I can't, it's hard to overexpress just how common these dimensional errors are. Junk, 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 garbage, nonsense. You see it again and again. It's so easy to do. I do it, every modeler does it occasionally. Setting the value of a flow equal to the value of a stock or a fraction of a stock. This flow is 50% of this stock value. Subtracting a flow from a stock, just subtracting it off. If you want to subtract off the flow from a stock in a meaningful way, you subtract off the flow times some unit of time from the stock. And then you get person minus person. Say. Comparing a stock and a flow. Is the stock greater than the flow? Folks, why is that meaningless? It seems so tempting. I mean, setting a value of a flow equal to the value of a stock, comparing a stock and a flow. Why is that meaningless? Because, folks, it, it's going to be critically dependent whether that model works. Its behavior will be totally different if you switch your unit of time from years to weeks to days. Because the flow will be totally different. Do you see that? You want your model to be able to have behavior that's consistent when you adjust the time. And if you're comparing a stock to a flow, you depend on the vagaries of what your unit of time is. The consistent way to do it would again be to have this constant that converts, you know, per unit multiplies by the appropriate unit of time. So comparing a stock and a flow, scale divergent behavior, totally different behavior if you're switching your, your units of time. For a flow, multiplying rather than dividing the value of a stock by a time constant. So if we have an average time in that stock and we multiply the stock by that, so if we have a stock that measures people in persons, and we have an average time you spend in that stock of 10 days, an average time in the stock, maybe it's 10 days, for example. Um, what's, if, we, if we multiply the value of the stock by that length of time, what's the, dimension, the resulting dimension of the resulting value? What is it? If we have persons in the stock, and the amount of 
and then we have some amount of time in the stock, mu, we'll call it, the average time you spend in the stock. Maybe it's the count of infectious people. It's the average time you spend infectious. If we if we have uh, a value for that for the flow out of the stock, that's the stock times that amount of time. What's the units or what's the dimensions of multiplying that stock times that mu value? It is what? Person yeah, person times time. What do we need for that flow? If we have a stock of of dimension person, what do we need for the flow? It needs to be of dimension what? Yes, it needs to be person per time. That is the key thing you got to keep in mind with stock and flow models. You have a stock, the flow has got to be the, the, the units, you have a stock with dimension D. The dimension associated with the, the flows has got to be of dimension d divided by time. It has to be because of how the models, the semantics of the model, again, the integral that takes place there, flow times dt, summing it up. It's got to be that flow as dimension of the stock divided by time. Or if for a flow you divide by, Divide by the stock by a coefficient, by a by a um, by a hazard, um, a hazard in other words, um, a, a likelihood likelihood per unit time, likelihood per unit time. Um, if if we do that, um, we divide by it instead of multiply by it. Then once again, we're going to have the flow. So if we have this hazard, it's of dimension one over time. We did that earlier, alpha. And so if we have x divided by alpha, we get something of person time. Okay, so let's let's try doing a bit of model analysis here. A classic SIR model. We have S, I, and R. Be associated with person as a unit. Beta is a likelihood, so it's of dimension one. C, the contact rate, person per time that a given person sees. So person per time per person. So it's, it's dimension one over time. And this could be calculated from data on contacts of n people over some, some time interval, for example. And mu here will be time, the, the time to recover. And that's a consistent labeling of the different dimensions associated with this. Now, if we have a force of infection, you'll notice that this all makes sense. The force of infection, the dimension associated with the force of infection, this says units, but it should say dimension. The dimension associated with the force of infection is just the dimension of C, one over time, times the dimension of i over s plus i plus r. What's the dimension of i, of I over s plus i plus r? Who could tell me what the dimension of this is, of this quotient here? What's the dimension of i? Speak. Person. What's the dimension of the, of the denominator? Person. So what's the dimension of, of I divided by S plus I plus R? Dimensionless. Exactly. It's a fraction, right? Dimensionless. Does it depend on whether you count people in thousands or in individual people? No. Because if you're counting people in thousands, then that would affect both the numerator and denominator, so you still get a fraction. If you're counting them on one by one by one, then it's you also get a fraction out. So so that's dimensionless. And the dimension associated with beta, which is kind of hidden behind there, is dimensionless also. So the dimension associated with the force of infection is just dimension of C times dimensionless times dimensionless. In other words, it's dimension of C, which is one over time. And that makes sense. You have a certain chance per unit time of being affected, a certain fraction of the time, in other words, you get, you'd be 
per unit ton, you're going to be in fact a certain fraction. Okay. Um, so, and this this makes a lot of sense. You multiply the force of infection times s. Force of infection is just this chance per unit time you get infected. You multiply it times s, and it gives person per time who are getting infected. That's the rate of flow, number of infectives per unit time. Um, alternatively, you could you could just consider the reciprocal at that time. If we have a chance per unit time being infected, the reciprocal is just how long on average it takes us to get infected. So it's going to be a time. So it's reciprocal has to be a time. So it, it's, it's uh, dimension is, is one over time. Okay, let's talk about how you do this in Venson. Okay, so Venson performs the uh, dimensional simplification via simple algebra. Okay, um, in Venson models, if you associate dimensions with quantities, Benson will show a little pop-up that shows the dimension for variables, and it can check many aspects of the consistency. It's pretty good. So what can Benson do? Well, it can associate variables with units. It allows you to find new units, person, deer, bird, dollars, whatever, and define unit equivalents. You could say days and day are the same as, as far as, sometimes you say days, you know, person, um, you know, days is how you'll count one um, length of, of infection or what have you. Um, and you could, at other times, use, you know, dollar per day or what have you, um, just as a convenience. Um, so that's just a matter of sort of uh, how you say it. So how do you associate units with a variable? Well, what you do here is you indicate down here units. You just say person. See that? Say person here. Um, now you can go up to model settings and you can choose the units for time here. And then you can set unit equivalents if you want to. Hours, same as hours, da, 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 years, weeks, etc. Um, then you can request a dimensional consistency check. So once you've labeled everything in the model, you can do model unit check. And it will say, if you're in good shape, it will say units are A OK. If it's not in good shape, it will warn you. It'll say, okay, there's a there's a, errors in units of this. It says, okay, you have this equation, contacts per year equal contacts per day times days per year. Contacts per year is one divided by a year. Contacts per day is contact per day. Days per year is days per year. And it, and it comments on the nature of this. It says, okay, contacts per day is units contact per year but the left-hand side is units dimensionless per year. So it'll actually sort of warn you. Okay, um, I'm gonna do a, a sneak preview just in a couple of minutes. Um, well, okay, yeah, so we could um, we could talk this, 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 so everyone in the class, I would argue, should be able to do this sort of analysis. If you're using that, we'll do a lot of it for you. But you should be get familiar with labeling the units of things. It's a it may seem like a pain, but it will save you a lot of debugging time and a lot of frustration because you have an error sitting right in front of your nose, you know, alpha times x, where it really should be x divided by alpha, and you just don't notice it, but you notice immediately if you think about the dimensions. So I'd suggest that you become comfortable with that. But next, we're gonna talk about something that's that's much deeper, um, and that's been used for centuries to derive relationships. Um, so I've introduced this notation of putting these things in brackets to indicate their dimension. Um, and we talked about so how we have um, how we can use these dimensions uh, uh, to reason through dimensions associated with expressions. So here we have a is person, b person per time, c time, d dollars. So here we would have B times C, person per time times time, so that would be person, gets added to A, person, okay, so we have person per, and D is in the denominator, dollar, so it's person per dollar. Well, let's talk about models. So I'm, I'm just representing it here to be very transparent. So here, H dot, DH, DT, in other words, equals minus beta times HF, um, this is actually, you could find this in any logic too, as, in, as a, a system dynamics model. Um, 
we can do an analysis of this. And if H re represents hares and F represents foxes, then we have H, the unit of H being hair, unit of F being foxes. To be consistent, H dot DH DT, what units will that have? What units must this have? This, to give you a hint, this is the inflow here. This is the outflow. I know that because of the signs, inflow, outflow. So what units must H, so H is units of hair. What units must, must uh, H dot have? In other words, DH, DT, the rate of change of H. What must its, uh, sorry, its dimensions be? Dimensions must be what? DH, DT. Hairs per time. Hairs per time. Yeah. And similarly, F dot, fox, foxes per time. That's right. And now we can start to figure out, okay, more. Okay, so what must the unit of alpha be? If this, if this plus is going to be consistent, it's going to yield something of, of hairs per time, and H is measured in hairs, what must alpha be in terms of units? It must be, sorry? Yeah, per time. So some frequency, some sort of uh, chance per unit time, for example. Um, so it so happens it's a birth rate. Birth rate. So chance per unit time of a birth. Beta is a little bit more complex, but it needs to be one divided by fox per unit time. Um, so it's actually representing the chance that a hare will meet a fox per unit time. And gamma here is one over hair per unit time. Now the interesting thing is, if we wanted to find the frequency of oscillations here, unit of that is one over time. It's going to be one over time. How frequently it oscillates. How many, how many cycles are there per year? Say? And it turns out that this is a particularly skill that people had last century and back. People could look at a model like this and just derive what it must be from dimensional considerations. So among other things, okay, we know that the dimension of this has to be unit one over time. We know it can't depend directly on, on beta or, or H because it's independent actually of the initial units and we're not going to be able to have the foxes and hares sort of cancel uh, in them. They wouldn't, the dimensions associated with foxes and hares wouldn't be canceled uh, within them. The exponent of time here is minus one and it's actually a symmetry here. So you have sort of alpha and delta and symmetric positions, beta and, and gamma. And based on that, you can come to the conclusion that the period must depend on the square root of alpha times, uh, times gamma. Square root, because alpha times gamma would be of dimension one over time squared. So to get something one over time, you have to take the square root of it. And this is correct. Just some dimensional analysis from dimensional considerations and noticing, okay, this is kind of symmetric, so it's got to depend on both, um, both alpha and delta. If it depends on one, it has to depend on the other. Can't depend on these guys because foxes and hares wouldn't be able to cancel, and it doesn't depend empirically on the, the number of uh, hares or foxes. It's, it's got to depend on in this sort of way, and so you can drop it. Similarly, people centuries ago derived what must be the um, oscillation time of a pendulum. How must it depend on gravity and how must it depend on the length of the pendulum based on sort of sim simple dimensional considerations. Can't depend on mass because there's nothing to cancel that, etc. And, and you can go through the calculation. Um, Okay, I'm just going to give a hint as to what's going to come in, in completing this next time. So there's something called the Buckingham Pi theorem. 
And this is this is another place that starts to get really, really deep. So basically the deal is the world doesn't care about our unit system. The world behavior is not going to change. The behavior of pendulums, the behavior of cycles of foxes and hares are not going to change if, if we abolish the metric system and adopted, you know, uh, adopted unit systems based on imperial units again, or if we were to, um, we were to measure time in, in microseconds or whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't care. Um, and in fact, any dimensionally homogeneous equation, any equation that is meaningful in terms of only adding consistent equations can be re-expressed with a smaller number, a smaller equal number of dimensionless variables, okay? Um, and it turns out that often we will get a smaller number of variables. We could take our equation. We could take our agent-based model. We can take our system dynamics model, the stocks and flows. And we can come up, and those models have a certain number of parameters. And we can come up with a smaller number of parameters very often that are dimensionless parameters. And we can verify that as long as those dimensionless parameters have the same value, retain the same value, it doesn't matter what the value of the actual parameters, original parameters are. It's really what matters is the value of those dimensionless parameters. And then we can do calibration on those. We can do sensitivity analysis on those. We don't have to do them with all the original parameters. We can just do it with the dimensionless parameters. Okay. And moreover, it turns out that after calculating those, we can figure out how to build a scale model that exhibits comparable behavior, but with a much smaller population, for example. Okay? Um, so we can take our SIR model, and through some dimensional analysis like this, in the dimensional analysis, we're going to figure out, okay, for our dimensions, this is where, where I was talking with Dylan earlier, we have some number of physical variables, these are parameters. We have some dimensions, which are relevant, germane to our, to our problem. And we're going to map out those original parameters, what are their dimensions. And through a set of simple algebraic calculations, we could fill in this matrix, and we could basically figure out what the dimensionless parameters are. We're going to be able to read them off this lower section here. Okay. And when we do this, we can arrive at a set of dimensionless parameters that are a simplification of the original ones. So here, we started with these three parameters, beta, c, and mu, and we end up with two parameters instead, n over mu c, n is the total population size, and beta. Those are the two parameters. Those are the ones that matter. The others, if the particular values of mu and c, it doesn't matter as long as we keep the value of this constant. As long as we, we, we maintain that uh, to be constant. And it turns out that once we've identified that, we can then build scale models. We can build models whose behavior is the same as a large-scale population but they use perhaps one thousandth of the population size. Just as we can take a full scale model of a plane that we want to build, create a small scale model and put it in a wind tunnel and reliably understand that behavior of the larger plane. So we can create a very small scale model that is a reliable predictor of is consistent in its behavior and some clearly defined mapping to behavior of the entire system. Okay. So we can do this through this same sort of calculation. So I'm going to have to triage for next time. I'm either going to give that lecture next time on how we do that, or I will give it separately and refer you to it, and we'll spend uh, our last uh, session next time on some other issues. So I'm going to have to figure out what that is. but. Um, this is sort of where dimensional analysis can lead and why it can be so handy
because we can reduce the size, the number of parameters we need to look at in sensitivity analysis and calibration analysis to a small set, a parsimonious set. So we can pay attention to the things that really matter rather than simply look at all parameters. And it reflects the fact that, once again, the world's behavior doesn't depend on our choice of units. It depends on dimensionless quantities. And if we can figure out what those dimensional quantities are, we've got the essential factors that matter in the real performance of the system. Okay. And we can do this in a systematic way. Okay, so uh, I've gone on too long right now. Um, I appreciate your patience. And um, I'm going to close now. I know there was, uh, were some people wanting to talk with me after class today. I'd be glad to do that. Um, I also do have some time tomorrow if uh, people need to, to meet and quite a bit of time on Monday. So we can talk uh, then as well. Thanks very much.